we're live. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Christian Lischer. I am in Geneva, Switzerland, and I'm very excited to open the inaugural uh, session of the new seminar series, which uh, seems to really spark a lot of interest. We have more than 300 people connected already. Um, addiction is a disease that touches many people worldwide and thus constitutes a tremendous burden to societies. On the other hand, we have a thriving research community interested in, in elucidating the neural mechanism underlying the disease. Because of the pandemic, our regular meetings have been curtailed, which is why, together with Megan Creed, Marina Picciotta, and Eric Nessler, we have launched the worldwide seminars on neurobiology of addiction. As you see, the program has a diverse crowd of uh, many people, some studying systems that are affected by addiction, some others how directly drugs change the brain. But we've also invited people who develop technology to better study the disease. Before we get started, a few organizational points. So the seminars are every Thursday at noon EST. As a result, there's 6 p.m. in Central Europe, except the last two weeks of March when they are at 5 p.m. because of the difference in change in summertime. You can watch us here or also conveniently live on the, our YouTube channel where we have the event also after the direct transmission. We do have already a full program until the summer break, but if you have suggestions, don't feel bashful, send us your suggestions. The four organizers, this is special for this series, are joined by trainee co-hosts. So today I'm very happy to have Celine Nicola from the University of Bordeaux to help with the moderation. Celine will now introduce our today's speaker, Patricia Janak from Baltimore. We then have 45 minutes for her talk, followed by question and answers. Please already submit your questions in writing, and Celine and I will relay them to the speakers. So now, without any further ado, Celine, please present today's speaker. Hi, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Patricia Janak, who is our first speaker to inaugurate the worldwide seminar on neurobiology of addiction. Patricia received her bachelor's degrees in psychology and biology from Rutgers College, and then she got her PhD in biological psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, under the supervision of Joey Martinez. Then she did two postdocs, one at the Wake Forest School of Medicine under the guidance of Donald Woodward, and the second one at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Then Patricia joined the Ernest Gallo Clinic and Research Center at the University of Carolina, San Francisco, as an assistant professor. She was appointed as an associate professor in 2006 and a full professor in 2011. After, in 2014, Patricia joined the faculty of Johns Hopkins University, where she is currently a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences in the School of Arts and Sciences and in the Salomon Snyder Department of Neuroscience in the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. During her career, Patricia made a major contribution in understanding behavioral and neurobiological mechanisms underlying adaptive and maladaptive reward-seeking behavior. With more than 125 papers and 11,000 citations. And today she's going to share with us the latest result from her lab in reward signaling in ventral basal ganglia circuits. Patricia, I give you the stage. Thank you so much, Celine, for that introduction. And thank you, Christian and the members of the committee. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to give the inaugural lecture in this uh, wonderful series on the neurobiology of addiction. Uh, it is wonderful to speak with you all through the magic of, of the internet. I can't see any of your faces. I wish I could, uh, but I'm still very happy that, that we get to connect in this way. So as you heard, my lab is interested in studying 
reward-seeking behavior, and specifically the neural processes that underlie this. And today I'm going to tell you about some work from our lab focusing in on dynamic reward signaling in the ventral basal ganglia, specifically in the ventral pallidum. So we're interested, as I mentioned, in what the processes are that determine our reward-seeking behavior, both from the behavioral level and the neural level. And when we think of organisms seeking out reward, there are three important things to consider. The first is in real time, the decision that one takes. Will you have a drink of water? When you choose between foods, will you take the donut or the piece of broccoli? Uh, if you are a person with a substance use disorder, will you decide to go to the bar and have a drink or will you stay home that evening? And decisions are gated importantly, by the motivational state of the subject. And uh, this is easily uh, seen as important when you think about drives such as thirst or hunger. If you're choosing between water and food, thirst will determine which you might choose. In the case of addiction, motivational states like withdrawal states or craving states may impact greatly the decision that, that an individual takes. Both of these processes depend heavily on the prior experience of the individual. So as for example, individuals begin to use drugs, they learn about the properties of that outcome. They learn about the conditions under which it's available, how they must plan and how they must act in order to obtain that. So these three uh, processes together are important for understanding uh, addictive behavior, which is an eventual goal of, of uh, those of us speaking in this series. So in order to understand these different processes in the brain, um, we, we might wish, and here this is just to remind me to say what I said, it's important to understand these processes to contribute to our understanding of why people may take alcohol and drugs of abuse under conditions in which it is not beneficial for them. So we know a fair amount about reward circuits within the brain that are important for reward seeking behavior, whether that behavior is uh, looking for something natural like food reward or social reward, or whether it's a drug reward. And there are many interacting regions within the brain and shown here in this cartoon of a rodent brain that evaluate rewards and learn about rewards and help subjects shape their future behavior in order to optimize the acquisition of rewards. Today, I'm gonna to focus on studies from our lab looking at the role of one of these regions called the ventral pallidum. The ventral pallidum is within the ventral basal ganglia and it's often considered as a mere way station be, um, receiving input from its more famous neighbor, the nucleus accumbens, and just being a way station on the way to the production of reward-seeking behavior itself. But in fact, there's a lot of interesting neural processing ongoing in this region that suggests it's more than just a motor output area, but something that we want to consider if we want to have a deep understanding of how the brain organizes reward-seeking behavior. And so I'm gonna tell you about some of those studies today. And in order to uh, really make the point that I think it's important to focus on this brain region, I want to go over a little bit of the past work that's looked at the role of the ventral pallidum in reward-seeking behavior. And so I'll mention some of those studies briefly here. We've actually known for many decades that the ventral pallidum is a region important for drug-seeking behavior. So Carol Hubner and George Kube showed in 1990 that lesions of the VP reduce heroin and cocaine self-administration in rats. And this finding has been followed up by a number of groups. And here I want to show uh, results from one of these studies from Stephen Mahler conducted when he was in the Aston Jones lab. And what Stephen did was use chemogenetics to inhibit a ventral palatal projection to the VTA. So he's inhibiting VP neurons. And when he does this, he reduces cocaine seeking behavior by rats very substantially. So this shows that the VP is important for drug-seeking behavior. In addition, studies have shown that addictive drug, drugs themselves affect the physiology of the ventral pallidum and other kinds of functions of the ventral pallidum. In a study giving, given, giving chronic cocaine from Creed and colleagues, 
uh, they found that, that repeated cocaine alters the synaptic communication between the nucleus accumbens and cells in the ventral pallidum, and that this alteration is important for effects of chronic cocaine on behavior and other effects on reward processing in general. And here I'm just showing a result, one of the results from this paper, in which the authors reversed the cocaine-induced synaptic change uh, between the nucleus accumbens and the ventral pallidum, thereby reducing, here in this blue dot here, a chronic behavioral effect of cocaine, in this case, behavioral sensitization. So I show these examples to make uh, clear the point that the VP is important for the effects of abused drugs on behavior and on the seeking behavior for abused drugs. How might the VP participate in drug-seeking behavior? To, to uh, think about this and to discover this, one uh, approach is to look at the activity of these neurons during reward-seeking behavior in general. And so this has been used by a number of groups uh, using the technique of in vivo electrophysiology, where you can measure the spike output of individual neurons in awake behaving rodents. And in this example here from Jocelyn Richard with Howard Fields, uh, Jocelyn showed that responses of VP neurons to cues that give subjects the opportunity to press a lever to receive reward are much larger when the animals actually decide to seek reward than when they do not. So here is a VP signal related to a reward-seeking action, actually predictive of it. And in this classic paper from the Aldridge lab, Aldridge lab we see that Q responses in the VP uh, seem to be related to the valence of the outcomes they predict. So under normal conditions, rats like to drink sucrose solutions and don't like to drink salt water. And here we see a strong Q response to the sucrose Q. If you make uh, rats salt deprived such that now they like salt water, we see the emergence of a Q response uh, for the salt that looks like the Q response for sucrose. So this suggests something like valence encoding uh, occurring here in the VP. And indeed, the response to the actual outcomes also shifts when rats move from a normal state to a sodium depleted state. So there's very interesting encoding of rewards, actions made to get rewards, and cues that signal rewards in the ventral pallidum. Uh, but besides just this sort of real-time encoding of cues, actions, and rewards, recent studies of the ventral pallidum give hints that these signals may also encode aspects of the subject's expectation for reward. And one example of this comes from recent work out of Bo Lee's group. Here, I'm showing a figure from their recent paper where we see a subset of VP neurons that normally have an excitatory response to a positive outcome. But on trials in which that positive outcome is omitted, we see an inhibition of the firing rate. And so this is reminiscent, of course, of a negative reward prediction error, like one sees in dopamine neurons when reward is omitted, expected reward is omitted. So all of these together, uh, help support the idea that there's something interesting going on in the ventral pallidum related to reward-seeking behavior, and we would like to understand it better. So in our lab, we decided to investigate how outcomes themselves were encoded by the spike activity of neurons in the VP. And this, in fact, was a question attacked by David Ottenheimer when he was a graduate student in the lab. And David was assisted in this uh, task with a, a strong collaboration with Jocelyn Richard when she was a senior scientist in the lab. And this collaboration was very key because Jocelyn came to the lab already an expert in the ventral pallidum. And so really was an important uh, guide uh, for this entire project. So how are outcomes encoded by VP circuitry? Uh, since we're eventually interested in understanding how subjects make choices among outcomes, including different rewards or rewards that are natural versus rewards that are drug rewards, David decided it was key to investigate this question in the setting of multiple rewards. So David uh, lowered electrodes into the ventral pallidum, and these are chronically implanted multi-wire electrodes that allowed him to record the spike activity of individual neurons during behavior. And he looked at the reward-related activity of these neurons 
during a very simple task where rats sample two different reward solutions, sucrose and maltodextrin. And these liquid reward solutions are both carbohydrates and importantly, were calorically equivalent. And these are solutions that rats like. If you just give them a bottle of one or the other, they'll avidly consume that. And David designed this very simple task where rats were in a standard animal chamber, so a box, and they could hear an auditory cue. And the auditory cue told them reward was available. They moved to the reward port, put their snout into the port. And when they do that, half a second later, they receive either a bolus of sucrose or a bolus of maltodextrin. And which reward they receive is random through session time. So this allows David to look at the neural activity associated with these two different rewards. An interesting thing about maltodextrin and sucrose is that if you actually give rats a choice between them, say on their home cage, give them two bottles of each, they drink much more sucrose than maltodextrin, showing they have a preference for sucrose over maltodextrin. On the other hand, within this simple behavioral task, if you look at their lick rate as they're consuming each individual bolus of maltodextrin or sucrase, it's remarkably similar. So we have the interesting case where within the behavioral task, the motoric output is pretty much the same when subjects are sampling two different rewards that we know they prefer differently. In other words, they prefer sucrose over maltodextrin. So what did David see when he now went on to look at the spike activity of VP neurons in response to these two different rewards? He actually found a very interesting distinction uh, in contrast to the similar motor behavior in the way neurons in the ventral pallidum signaled these two different rewards. So looking at the population of neurons that are sensitive to reward receipt and dividing them up into sucrose trial responses and maltodextrin trial res responses, we see a very much larger mean response across the population for sucrose than for maltodextrin. And zero is the time at which the reward is delivered on every trial. So remember the rats approaching the reward port after the cue comes on, puts in his snout, and then the, the reward comes and he begins to lick. And we can measure this difference in neural activity. You can see this at the level of individual neurons in these heat maps here to the right, where we see the same neurons and their spike activity in response to sucrose and maltodextrin plotted. And you can see much stronger firing across the population for sucrose than maltodextrin. And this is a, a really large signal uh, present in a, in a very uh, big proportion of the neuronal population. So it could be that because of the importance of sucrose uh, in, in for mammals, that this is a, a response that's just obligatory and related somehow to detection of sucrose through taste systems. So one way that uh, David checked this is by switching sucrose for water in a different session. And so now subjects are receiving interleaved trials with maltodextrin or, or water. And it's important to mention that these rats are not water restricted and they're not food restricted. So we're seeing their natural preference for these different things that they are consuming. And if you look at the lick rate during the session, when subjects get maltodextrin or water, you see it's quite different. That's because they're not really uh, seeking the water or finding it uh, to have high value because they're not thirsty. So we now want to look at the neural data in response to receiving these two rewards. And when David compares the neural activity taken at a time early in the ingestion of these rewards, as you'll see, it's right uh, before and around the second second, we see a different pattern than we did before. Now, maltodextrin signaling is not the lowest average reward signal, but instead is the highest average reward signal. We see an increase in activity on trials when subjects ingest maltodextrin and a decrease when it's water. And you can see this dramatic switch when you look again at the heat plots at the population of individual neurons, where here when maltodextrin is the preferred reward, we see much stronger firing than when it is the less preferred reward. So these relationships are not fixed by some sort of properties of the 
uh, taste themselves. Indeed, when David uh, conducted yet another behavioral session, combining water, maltodextrin, and sucrose together in the same session and, and looking at how these different rewards were encoded, we see that they are ranked by the relative preference that the animal has with the activity for sucrose higher than that for maltodextrin, which is higher than that for water, which you can see again nicely in these heat plots. So this kind of signal that we see here is consistent with a readout of the subject's current preference, the current relative preference as they're comparing the value of the rewards available to them that day in the, in the session. That would be one interpretation. But another interpretation of a signal that looks like this is that it reflects some kind of prior expectation that the subject had. And it, these increases and decreases could uh, reflect deviations from a mean expected reward from some sort of signal that's akin to a reward prediction error signal. And so this was one question uh, that we had when looking at these data. Uh, to address this question, David uh, formed a collaboration with Bilal Bari when he was a graduate student in the lab of Jeremiah Cohen here at Johns Hopkins. And what Bilal and Jeremiah helped uh, David do is figure out a way to quantitatively examine the spike activity of VP neurons during rewards to see if their activity was uh, similar to what would be expected in, for an RPE, or reward prediction error signal, or instead was more similar to what you might expect from just the readout of ongoing uh, current reward. So Bilal and David uh, created three different models that they fit to each spike train of the recorded neurons, looking at the spike activity at the time of reward. And one model is the RPE model. One is looking to see if activity looks like a real-time report of the outcome. And one looks to see if the activity is unrelated to the actual events happening in time. And then they look to see which model might best fit the spike activity of different neurons. And just to mention, of course, to look to see if the activity is like a reward prediction error, really use just a canonical uh, sort of uh, algorithm for this. And to remind us all, reward prediction errors are the difference in the outcome that the subject receives compared with what the subject expected. So the outcome received minus the, what the subject expected gives a positive prediction error when the outcome is better than expected and negative when the outcome is worse than expected. And this error is used to update the value of that outcome on an iterative trial by trial basis. So when uh, Bilal and David uh, analyze the spike trains of their neurons, they found that an almost 20% subset of reward responsive neurons had firing consistent with a reward prediction error. Another proportion, almost 20%, had firing current uh, consistent with a report of the current outcome. And then a, a big proportion were unmodulated. So we can now, to get an intuitive understanding of this, take these subsets of neurons and plot their activity when the subjects are getting sucrose versus maltodextrin, again, to see what it looks like. And because we see that the, some of them seem to care about past history, they have a, a reward prediction error component, we'll plot uh, the activity based on what the animal received in the trial right before. In other words, if we look at the activity here of these reward prediction error neurons to sucrose and maltodextrin, we can plot the activity when animals receive sucrose after a prior trial when they receive maltodextrin, so a better than expected reward, or when animals receive sucrose after a trial in which they receive sucrose. And we see that this pattern is consistent with what one expects for a history dependent signal. And the flip is true here for the maltodextrin signal. And we see little evidence for this kind of history in the current outcome population and no interesting reward signaling at all in the unmodulated neurons. A similar kind of uh, breakdown of the population is seen when you look at data from sessions when three outcomes are available, including the undesirable water, 
we see a proportion of neurons that seem to signal something like reward prediction error and another proportion that signal current outcome. Uh, and it's interesting to think of these reward prediction error neurons differently than this way where you divide them up based on the identity of the reward. What if we instead looked at the activity, the spike activity of these neurons based on the estimated reward prediction error? So if this is a reward prediction error signal, instead of just seeing these sorts of three different mean levels of activity, we would expect fluctuating signals based on the current estimated RPE. So one way to look at that and get a nice intuitive feel for that is to divide the trials up by the reward prediction error. So those with a high prediction error and not so high, around zero, somewhat negative and very negative. And that's what uh, David did in this figure here. And this lets us look at uh, the reward activity when the reward prediction error is very high versus intermediate versus low. And you see it's really a beautiful graded signal here at the time of reward consistent with this kind of teaching signal. So we thought this was really interesting, but this analysis didn't tell us uh, some key things we would like to know. If this is a reward prediction error like signal, we would expect that the subject is using this somehow to adapt their future behavior. Uh, the task that we are running right now isn't really optimized to, to look at that, but we took a look at what animals were doing within uh, the context of this behavior in any case. Remember, they're just hearing tones and poking their nose into this port to drink reward. And there is an intertrial interval, and sometimes subjects disengage from this area and wander around other parts of the chamber and groom and do various things like that, scratch. And so what David did was take um, each session from each subject and map their location in the chamber during the intertrial intervals on trials where they had just received the mo more preferred reward sucrose or the less preferred reward maltodextrin. And what you can see just by looking at the colors is that subjects tend to move away from the port more when they just had a reward that's less preferred. And if you look at where they were when the cue for the next trial occurred, which is where these black X's are, and measure distance from the port, you see that on average, they're further away from the port after this less preferred reward. It's a subtle effect, but it is reliable, and it's even stronger when you add in this even less preferred reward. So they're less likely to hang out at the port waiting for the next trial when they just got something they don't like very much. That makes intuitive sense. So one might uh, propose that the behavior of the subjects during the intertrial interval is impacted by the RPE signal that just occurred when they uh, detected the prior reward, be it water, maltodextrin, or sucrose. If that's true, one should be able to manipulate this signal and change this behavior. So to do that, uh, David turned to our resident optogenetics experts in the lab, graduate students Kurt Frazier and Tabitha Kim, and together this team applied optogenetics to be able to stimulate or inhibit VP neurons during reward receipt to see if this behavior was uh, alterable. And so this just shows uh, how they did this using either ARCH or channel adopsin, and importantly, inhibiting neurons during reward delivery not outside the reward delivery time period. And then the behavioral measure of interest was to look at what was happening during the intertrial interval. Now in these uh, sessions, subjects just received one kind of reward and that was sucrose and their neurons were manipulated on half of the trials. So we could compare intertrial interval behavior when we turned up the putative RPE uh, or turn down the putative RPE, sorry, this is the inhibition uh, section of the slide, or turned up the putative RPE with excitation during reward receipt. And so uh, the results actually fit the hypothesis. So if you excite neurons when animals are receiving sucrose, then right after that, in the intertrial interval after that trial, they spend more time hanging out close to the port awaiting the next trial than on a non-stimulation trial. So you see this decrease in distance from the port in the experimental animals, 
And we see the exact same thing in a mirror image with inhibition. So inhibition during sucrose leads to more likelihood of being further away from the port during the ITI, seen here as this increase. So this is some evidence that this signal in the VP that happens at the time of reward can impact future behavior as would be predicted for an RPE-like signal. So what I've told you so far is that VP neural activity distinguishes among rewards based on their relative value, and that this signal in at least a subset of the neurons is sensitive to the past reward history and provides a prediction error signal to update reward value. But if we go back to the beginning of this talk, we're really interested in how subjects evaluate rewards in order to make choices. So how are these signals used in the realm of decision making? Uh, and so to address this question, uh, David began to think about the kinds of situations in which we're making choices, and he became very interested in how uh, organisms uh, make choices that are biased by motivational drives, especially when motivational drives are shifting. And that's pretty uh, easy to think about if you imagine choosing between food and a glass of water, whether you're thirsty or not will likely impact your choice. And as mentioned before, motivational state and motivational drives uh, clearly have a role to play in addiction and in impacting decisions that people make to take uh, addictive drugs. So David designed a behavioral task where he could examine these issues uh, called the dynamic preference task. Actually, he designed a set of tasks, but today I'll just uh, be able to focus on one of those. And it's important to know a few things about these behavioral tasks that we will use in rats. So animals will be choosing between sucrose and water by pressing levers, a sucrose lever or a water lever. And they begin each day thirsty and they assuage their thirst during the session. And the inclusion within the task of forced choice trials where they must uh, get uh, sucrose or water allow us to continue to probe the neural dynamics over time as preference presumably shifts as subjects become less thirsty. So a task that can let us do that uh, works in the following manner. So 40% of the trials that uh, subjects are exposed to are free choice trials. There's an auditory cue that sounds that lets subjects know that they now have the opportunity to press either the left or right lever to get either sucrose or water, whichever they prefer. On the 60% of trials remaining, the animals don't have a choice about which reward they will get. There's a cue that sounds, and this cue tells them to go to the port, and once there, they'll receive either sucrose or water. The cue does not tell them which reward they will be receiving as before. And so we can now look at the behavioral response subjects make during choice trials to get a measure of their preference. Do they prefer water or sucrose at any one point? On the other hand, we can look at the neural response from these trials over the whole session to see if it's stable or if it changes as subjects' uh, satiety levels change as they're less thirsty or as their preference for rewards change. So here's an example of what behavior looks like from one subject when run on this task. And this shows a session in which a thirsty rat begins the session by making many choices for water. The choices are these long purple lines for water and long purple lines here represent choices on the sucrose level lever. And you can see many water choices at the beginning of the session, few sucrose choices. And by the end of the session, few water choices and many sucrose sessions because all things being equal, rats prefer sucrose, but when thirsty, they prefer water. And these short black lines denote the distribution of forced outcome trials. So they, they continue to receive water and sucrose throughout the session on these interleaved forced trials. If we look at their behavior on choice trials, we see that preference measured as a portion of choices 
shifts after about 50 trials in this task from a preference for water to a preference for sucrose. And in the data that I'll be telling you about now, each of the five rats looked at showed the same kind of preference curve where there's a shift for sucrose as subjects become less thirsty and value for sucrose therefore becomes greater than the value for water. So what do ventral palatal neurons do under this condition? We expect there to be some kind of signal about relative preference because that's what we saw before in the sucrose and maltodextrin procedure. But what we were not sure of was how this changing a drive state produced by satiation of thirst might reveal itself within the neural activity. And so in order to probe whether neurons care about the changing uh, drive state over time, uh, as a first pass, David decided to fit a generalized linear model to the activity at reward for each of these different neurons. And he also looked at the activity at Q onset, but we'll uh, here focus on the activity at reward. And he asked uh, whether that activity could be best predicted by just uh, the outcome difference, so the, the preference difference, just by time, trials through the session, or whether there was some interesting interaction between time and outcome. And in fact, this is what we see in the behavior, right? So over time, the subject's preference for outcomes switches. And water is king in the beginning, but not the end. Sucrose is king at the end. And what he found is that about 70% of VP neurons um, have activity that can be explained by an interaction between the outcome the subject's receiving and time within the session. So this suggests that VP neurons uh, may care about changing motivational state over time, as well as preference, which is something we knew before. So let's look at what these outcome by time neurons look like when, we, when they are uh, firing in response to reward. So we can uh, look at the average activity of the population here on the, at the right. And here on the left is the activity of one example neuron showing you the spike firing when subjects are getting sucrose or water on forced trials. So when they, when they must get delivery of this from the beginning of the session to the end. And you can see dramatic changes, especially in the water response here by this neuron. And this is seen also in the population. If we divide the reward responses up into quarters of the session from the first set, uh, quarter to the last quarter, the end of the session, we see that an excitatory response for water flips to an inhibitory response at the mean population level. And we see a graded response, all excitatory, for sucrose over time, and actually increasing um, as sucrose becomes more preferred. And you can look at this more simply comparing these two through uh, this figure here, which uh, looks at the average firing rate within this bin, this gray column that you see here, over the four quarters of the session representing session time. So we, we see in the average activity of the population, this shift, which might correspond to the switching that animals show in their preference. Uh, but interestingly, it's not symmetrical. So if it, this were just a preference signal, we might expect these lines to be in mirror images of one another. Instead, the average activity of neurons here in the beginning is higher than the average activity of neurons in the end, averaging across outcomes. So it seems that satiation is probably also playing a role in the neural activity we see over time. That's what it looks like by looking at this activity. Can we find a way to actually uh, quantify that and characterize that more carefully? And so what David did was again, turn to uh, the idea of fitting models to spike firing through session time to see what kind of model might best explain the activity. And as mentioned, we might have expected these neurons to, to show activity that looked more or less something like this. Um, a, a preference uh, code, basically, where activity for sucrose smoothly increases and in parallel activity for water smoothly decreases. 
we might expect some neurons to show us a decreasing response as animals reach satiety, as thirst uh, ends. But instead, what the population showed was something that looked more like this, a mix. And so the models that David uh, uh, designed um, looked to see if neural activity fits this kind of, of shape through time, or this shape, or a linear weighted combination of these two called the mixed model. And indeed, when you look at example neurons, such as this one, the activity of individual neurons looks much like the mixed model. And when you look across the population, we find that the mixed model is what best describes the activity of individual VP neurons. Now, it didn't have to be this way. So the population average might have looked at like this, but we still could have had substantial numbers of neurons that seem to just care about preference and others that seem to just care about satiety. But interestingly, most of them seem to integrate this information. And this makes sense and is congruent with a reward prediction error type signaling rather than just a readout of preference. The reward prediction error-like signal would take into account the changing value of the entire task as satiety uh, increases over the session. So this was uh, really uh, exciting to us. Uh, remember that um, all of this uh, that I've been talking about, these estimates of, of how these VP neurons are signaling relative to reward through the session has been based on estimates from activity from the forced trials. But through the session, animals also have free choice trials where they're choosing to lever press for sucrose or choosing to lever press for water. And what we wondered is if neurons that are sort of tracking this, this change over session as animals sample the different rewards, if these are uh, contributing in any way to the actual choice behavior of the animals. And so there are a couple of ways to look at this. One is to use the information from these models themselves to see if we can predict um, accurately the animal's actual real choice behavior. So what David did was use parameters that arose from this mixed best fit model for individual neurons to ask the neurons to estimate the animal's preference in a session time. So all the neurons recorded in one animal's particular session, looking at their spike activity and seeing what their estimate of preference would be. And what he found, if you focus in on this column right here, is that the preference over time estimated by the neurons themselves is remarkably similar to the preference curves generated by looking at the real choice behavior. So again, these come from looking at activity on trials that are not choice trials, yet you see uh, estimates of choice like uh, was is actually observed uh, in real time. And so these are uh, sessions from three different subjects, and you see they each have different sort of patterns through the session, and the mean activity here is, is really a wonderful match. So one way to look quantitatively at the match between the neural estimate and the behavioral estimate here is by looking at this indifference point, the time at which the subjects don't prefer sucrose or water, there it's 50-50, and seeing if the neural estimate of the indifference point is similar to the actual behavioral indif indifference point. And that's what you can see in this figure down here, where we're showing the number of trials wrong, the neural estimate is from the behavioral estimate for individual neurons. And what you can see is that many of the individual neurons have a really good estimate of the actual trial that, upon which this occurs. And these neurons are, again, just to, to be clear, the neurons that are sensitive to the outcome changing over time, so the outcome by time neurons. The rest of the population that doesn't seem to care about this uh, activity really doesn't provide a good estimate of the animal's choice behavior. So by looking at the neural activity in conjunction with behavioral activity, we can uh, find good evidence that these neurons in ventral pallidum are potentially important for instructing the animal's choice behavior. But another way to add to that evidence would be to turn again to optogenetics and try to manipulate VP neurons and see if we can alter choice behavior.
in a manner congruent with a signal like this. So David designed a task in which to do that. And in this task, he's looking at the comparison between sucrose and maltodextrin, because since we're trying to manipulate choice behavior, we want a uh, choice behavior that's stable over the session. So animals in this case are not thirsty, but we know they prefer sucrose. And so they have um, a proportion of free choice trials where they can pick the sucrose lever or the maltodextrin lever to get the reward that they want. And there are forced choice, forced choice trials where they must press levers for a specific reward, be it sucrose or maltodextrin. And what we're going to do now is to use general adoption to activate neurons within the ventral pallidum when animals receive maltodextrin, the less preferred reward, the one they choose uh, less often during choice trials. And we want to see if we can shift their choice behavior. And so animals were well trained up on this before the optogenetic manipulation experiment happened. And the results are shown here over on the right. Each dot is the preference measured by which levers they're pressing on the choice trials um, for sucrose versus maltodextrin. Each dot is an individual animal. Uh, gray are control subjects and blue are our channel adoption animals. And what we see is that during the session in which stimulation occurs when animals receive maltodextrin, preference switches dramatically for maltodextrin. So we can make animals uh, prefer something that normally is less preferred just by stimulating during the uh, uh, delivery of this. So this is consistent with a teaching signal role for this, this kind of activity during reward. Uh, if you want to know what the behavior looked like as it evolved to, through the session, each one of these lines is the smooth responses of an individual rat through sessions. And you see all of the uh, channel rhodopsis subjects show this switch from sucrose to maltodextrin. The control subjects basically uh, stay relatively stable. You can see here in the group means over the session. And more evidence that this is actually a, a learning effect where they've changed their uh, evaluation of the maltodextrin reward. Uh, it's become a better valued option. It can be seen when we look the next day after optogenetic stimulation, where we still see a significant difference relative to baseline, where our channel adoption animals are still showing stronger preference for maltodextrin than they normally would. And in fact, this takes a few days to resolve. So we were really uh, excited by these findings because they suggest that this uh, reward signal really can be used by subjects to inform their choice behavior. So what I've told you is that ventral palatal signaling, neurons in the ventral palatum uh, reflect uh, relative reward value and that that value signal is relative to the animal's current preference when it compares uh, different rewards available to it at that day. Uh, interesting subset of these neurons show firing at this time consistent with a history-based reward prediction error. And these relative value signals also integrate uh, information about the internal motivational state. So we use thirst uh, to manipulate the motivational state to show that. And these uh, outcome signals, these reward signals that occur at the time of reward can affect future behavior as you would expect if they do have a role as a teaching signal. So we show they can impact task engagement, but of most interest to us uh, today, they can impact choice behavior. So what we would like to know, of course, is how these signals that we see here in the ventral pallidum impact other regions that the ventral pallidum is connected to. You may know that the ventral pallidum has a major projection to the ventral tegmental area where the famous dopamine neurons reside that emit their own reward prediction error to affect uh, future behavior. And we're interested in whether the RPE-like signals in VP become part of the computation of RPEs uh, made by dopamine neurons. This is something we, we don't know yet. Ventral pallidum neurons project to many other different regions. Uh, besides receiving a projection from the nucleus accumbens, they also uh, project back to the nucleus accumbens. And we're especially intrigued by a recent finding coming out of Megan Creed's lab uh, 
uh, at Washington University in St. Louis showing that neurons in VP that are excited by reward may drive reward consumption behavior through an action within the nucleus accounted shell. So you, you may get to hear about some of those findings that uh, Dr. Creed is a speaker in this um, series that you're listening to right now. But those are super intriguing findings, and, and we're interested to know whether the population that we're interested in here that I've talked to you about today uh, overlaps with that. So there's a lot of work to do to understand how the different uh, reward signals we um, characterized in the VP affect the larger reward circuit. But we hope that um, by understanding how this may happen, we get more insight into the control of uh, subjects' behavior as they're choosing which reward they might uh, wish to have at any given moment. And as I mentioned before, that's something that we think is, is uh, very important to understand, both for understanding how brains work when we seek natural rewards, uh, we and other animals, but also for the translational aspect uh, when we think about the processes happening in the brain as subjects uh, may take rewards such as alcohol or drugs and when it's uh, not beneficial for them. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, and I'd like to, again, thank the people uh, that conducted this work. I tried to mention many during the, the talk, but I have these different uh, pictures from various past you know, pre-COVID lab events. Here's David again in, in these gatherings. Here's Jocelyn Richard. And I want to thank again, Kurt and Tabitha for their uh, contributions to these studies and our important collaboration with Bilal and Jeremiah, uh, our funding from NIH and David's funding from NSF and, and you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for a absolute uh, great talk. Um, maybe if you unshare your screen because we had some bandwidth issue here. So then maybe the camera is gonna come on again and we can have the discussion uh, with the video. If you, Trisha, are you there? I am here, yeah. So here's yeah, so the- So just uh, stop, the, stop the screen sharing. I, I, got um, it. Yeah, okay. Let's give her a minute. Hmm. I'm not seeing that control. Do you see that on your end, Christian? There we go. Yeah, I, I did it. So now you have to, yeah, your video is not on, but let, let me toggle your video on. Okay, now. Perfect. Hopefully, Hopefully you're gonna come back on. Okay, so we do can have a number. Me? Yes, we can hear you, we can hear you. That's the most important. So we do have a number of questions, obviously. Um, so one, the first one from Megan Creed, you a little bit touched upon it during the discussion, which obviously is the intriguing observation that you have several functional population of neurons that you find in the VP. And then obviously the question is how do they map onto uh, uh, the projections onto their uh, genetic identity. Uh, what do you think? Are, for example, the RPE neurons those that project back to the VTA? This is a, a great and very important question. So um, our experiments are conducted in wild type rats, so we really don't have access to the kinds of genetic tools to let it, us identify if they're, for example, GABAergic neurons, glutamatergic neurons, etc. cetera. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you, we can hear you, sure. Ah, okay, uh, for some reason the video is moving in and out. Uh, but, but most of the neurons in the VP are GABAergic, and um, so we, we think with those probably what we are recording from. We haven't yet identified projection-specific responses within our system. So we've begun trying recording in two different interconnected regions to look at how activity may be correlated in time, but we haven't done the necessary kinds of experiments that, uh, that you're asking about to let us know if it's just neurons projecting to the BTA that have the RPE signal or whether that's really distributed throughout projections from uh, VP to a number of different regions. So that, that's a very important uh, 
future uh, set of studies that, that really needs to be done. So it's nice to have the signal. What is it used for? How is it dispersed through the circuit? Critical. Okay, thank you so much. So Celine, next question. Yeah, so Patricia, the next question is, are RPE signals in VP upstream or downstream of part of dopaminergic neurons? Because the latency seems slower for VP than known for dopamine activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a great and related question. So there are connections from VP to VTA, but also projections from VTA back to uh, VP and also multi sort of stop multi synaptic pathways between the two regions. And so we don't know yet um, how these signals are derived. Do they get input from VTA or give input back to VTA? So just to give you a little insight in very pilot experiments, we were looking on a neuron by neuron basis at latency for the response in VTA and in VP, we see evidence for communication both ways. So sometimes the latency is faster in the VTA than the VP and in a, other neurons, the opposite is the case. So again, this is something that remains to be observed and, and really requires using tools that can let you look at specific projections. You need to be able to isolate them. And so we hope to do that in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is related to the optogenetics experiment. And so David was inhibiting and activating VP neurons this indiscriminately, even though only 20% of them are RPE neurons. How do you think that impacting the behavior? How do you think that impact the behavioral results? Is there yeah, any way to specifically manipulate it only the RPE cells? Uh, that, that's a really good idea. So uh, finding a way to specifically manipulate only those cells uh, could be difficult if we perchance found that all of those RPE cells were part of a specific projection, we could then manipulate just that specific projection. That would be ideal. We don't have that information now. But, but the questioner really um, hits on an important um, drawback to optogenetic studies that, that we need to all keep in mind, which is um, when you just stimulate artificially a large population of neurons, you're not necessarily exactly recapitulating the pattern of activity that one would see naturally. So we take it as one bit of evidence along with all of the other pieces of evidence uh, for the story. Yeah, so a somewhat related question from Marina is, uh, even the channel rhodopsin is expressed in VP neurons everywhere, I guess. It's, it's not only CAM kinase 2 or GAD neurons. Okay, so another question is a little bit, so what do you think would be happening in situations where animals are exposed to addictive drugs? How would that change the uh, physiology that you described? Uh, that's a great question, and I, I haven't given it the careful thought that, uh, that that deserves, but we know from work by yourself, Christian, and others, that repeated drugs change the physiology of the system. So it changes synaptic weights for inputs coming into the system. It probably changes the expression of various things uh, within VP neurons themselves. So I would expect some alterations in the way the system functions, but I don't know yet which way that would go and how it might alter the signals we're seeing. Uh, will they be stronger, perhaps? Will they be less... Uh, mutable, less flexible. These are things that, that we don't know yet. It would be interesting to look at them in the context where animals had uh, received repeated drug or when animals were actually choosing between drug and some kind of other reward. Okay. So, Celine, you have a last question or? Uh, I think I'm scrolling down. There's a lot of compliments compliments on the yeah. presentation in the question session. Oh, thank you, everybody. Okay. Oh, so I, then, see, uh, I see one from Anne Graybill. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I guess uh, then we're going to call it a wrap. And uh, thanks again to you, uh, Trisha.
And uh, we meet again next Thursday. And next Thursday, it's Megan Creed presenting again at noon EST and 6 p.m. in uh, Central Europe. Thank you so much for attending and have a great uh, evening, morning, wherever you be. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks for you. this opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.